Good morning, and welcome to the 30th Annual Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Program. I'm Wendy Dornberg, an attorney from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the chair of this year's event. Anupur Ayer Givargis, Chief of Staff for the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy will be singing the national anthem for us. Please rise for the presentation of colors and the national anthem. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we shared at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the Please be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the 30th Annual Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Program. My name is Brant Levine. I'm a senior attorney in the Civil Rights Division here at the Justice Department, and I serve as vice chair of the Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Committee. I am also the grandson of two Holocaust survivors. After my grandparents passed away, I became more involved with this interagency committee to honor their memories and to ensure that their stories of survival are not forgotten. And let me tell you, if my grandparents were here today, they would be cavelling, just bursting with pride. And not just because I'm up here on stage, but because of you all, 
the hundreds of public servants in this room, the thousands more that are joining us virtually. You see, my grandparents taught me that never again is not just a slogan, but a call to action. As federal employees, we have a unique ability, indeed a unique responsibility, to heed this call of action and to ensure that our government never again makes the same grave errors as it did in the past. Our duty is why the Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Committee exists today and why for 30 years now we have been gathering for this annual program, for remembrance, for reflection, for rededication. We remember the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. We reflect on why they and millions of other innocent people were targeted and murdered by the Nazi regime. And we rededicate our efforts to ensuring that nothing like the Holocaust can ever again cast a dark shadow over us. To accomplish our duties, we depend on the support from dozens of federal agencies. And we are so fortunate here today to have the leaders of many of those agencies with us, including I see in the, in the front row, Charlotte Burroughs, the chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, whose agency has provided stellar leadership to the committee over the years. And because we have over 20 of you here, I'm not going to call out everyone by name as we usually do, but please know that your presence here speaks volumes and we deeply appreciate your leadership. And speaking of leadership, my grandparents would really cavell over our next speaker. Our next speaker is someone who has a deep personal connection to the Holocaust and a deep professional commitment to public service. He is someone who, as a prosecutor, a judge, an advisor to the president, and as an American Jew, embodies our theme today of rays of hope. So please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. Thank you. It's a privilege to join you in this great hall as we honor the survivors of the Holocaust and remember its victims on Yom HaShoah. I'm grateful to the Federal Interagency Holocaust Remembrance Committee for inviting me to speak and hosting this important program now in its 30th year. Such a gift to be here with Peter Gorog and Manny Mandel, whose stories of courage and resilience inspire all of us. As Attorney General, I am proud to serve alongside 115,000 extraordinary professionals in the Justice Department. Every day we work to uphold the rule of law, to keep our country safe, and to protect the civil rights of everyone in this nation. Each of us came to the department for different reasons. For me, it was to repay the debt my family owes to this country for our very lives. Uh, before World War I, America gave my family refuge from religious persecution that allowed them to survive the Holocaust when World War II came. My grandmother was one of five children born in what is now Belarus. Three made it to the United States, including my grandmother. Two did not make it. They were killed in the Holocaust. If not for America, there is little doubt that the same would have happened to her. But this country took her in, and under the protection of its laws, she was able to live here without fear of persecution. I'm also married to the daughter of a refugee who found protection in the United States shortly after Hitler's army marched into Austria in 1938, my wife's mother escaped to America and under the protection of our laws, she too was able to live without fear of persecution. That protection is what distinguishes America from so many other countries. The protection of law the rule of law is the foundation of our system of government. 
It is also one of the most powerful tools in the fight against hate. All of us know about the disturbing rise in anti-Semitism in this country. Indeed, hate crimes against Jews comprise the majority of religion-related hate incidents reported in 2021. The Justice Department is doing everything in our power to combat the rise in hate-fueled acts and threats of violence. We are aggressively enforcing hate crime statutes. We have increased our capacity to investigate hate crimes and hate incidents, and working, we are working with state and local governments to do the same. We do this because we all know what happens when hate is allowed to take root. We do this to ensure that a tragedy like the Holocaust never happens again. And we do this because it is part of this department's historical inheritance. In 1945, Justice Robert H. Jackson, a former Attorney General of the United States, served as the Chief Prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. In his opening statement, after describing the horrors committed by the Nazis, Justice Jackson emphasized the importance of the rule of law. The trials would not only display to the world the depths of the defendant's depravity, he explained. They would also put the forces of law, quote, its precepts, its prohibitions, and most important of all, its sanctions on the side of peace so that men and women of goodwill in all countries may have leave to live by no man's leave underneath the law. Decades later, in 1979, the Justice Department created the Office of Special Investigations to identify, denaturalize, and deport Nazi criminals in the United States. That office also provided support to foreign counterparts in their efforts to bring to justice perpetrators in their jurisdictions. My friend Eli Rosenbaum, who's well known to all of you, formerly led the Office of Special Investigations. There he prosecuted World War II Nazi cases for nearly four decades. I first met Eli in an elevator here at DOJ on the day he brought Meep Gies to meet then Attorney General Janet Reno. Mrs. Gies had risked her life to protect Anne Frank and others hiding in the secret annex in Amsterdam. Now Eli leads our efforts against Russian war crimes. I'm glad that Eli will be moderating the discussion later in today's program. The Justice Department knows that we have an obligation, both legal and moral, to hold individuals accountable for crimes driven by anti-Semitism and by all forms of hatred an obligation to help prevent and deter future acts of hate, an obligation to preserve the rule of law. Through our work, we are sending a clear message that this Justice Department will not allow illegal acts of hatred to go unchecked or unchallenged. As Americans, we also share an obligation, an obligation to remember the horrors of the Holocaust and to listen to the stories of the survivors. We have a shared obligation to stand up against the dangerous rise in anti-Semitism and hatred in all of its forms. It is what we owe the six million murdered in the Holocaust and is what we owe future generations. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for those moving and inspirational remarks. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear stories from two Holocaust survivors about how their families couldn't live where they wanted to live because they were Jewish, couldn't work where they wanted to work because they were Jewish, and suffered other traumas because of their religion. Today, we are fortunate that we have civil rights laws prohibiting this type of discrimination. 
But just as importantly, we are fortunate to have a civil rights division that robustly enforce those laws. A civil rights division that provides a bright ray of hope to those seeking justice. A civil rights division where I could not be more proud to work. So please join me in welcoming the head of the Civil Rights Division, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am truly honored to be with you to remember a tragedy that must never be forgotten that commands our vigilance against hatred and bigotry, and that denies, any, denies us any moral refuge for silence and inaction. Acts of remembrance like today's program not only honor the victims, they also protect the rule of law. Nearly 20 years ago, in the rural town of Whitwell, Tennessee, middle school students conceived a unique and moving form of Holocaust remembrance. By any measure, Whitwell was not diverse. It had no Catholics, no Muslims, and no Jews. To teach about diversity, Linda Hooper, the middle school principal, decided to address the Holocaust. She found, though, that the students were simply unable to comprehend the enormity of the loss of six million Jews. To try to visualize the unfathomable number, they decided to collect six million paper clips. They solicited people from all over the world, presidents and prime ministers, Nobel laureates and diplomats, movie idols, and sports stars to send paper clips. The response was overwhelming as word spread Holocaust survivors came to speak with them and the students even procured an authentic German rail car to house the millions of paper clips they uh, collected. The project transformed the community, both students and parents. Every family in the town of 1600 got involved in what became the Children's Holocaust Memorial. The eye-opening moral education and the deep emotional engagement of these ordinary people affirms the value of remembrance and nourishes hope that we can prevent similar tragedies. But that hope is under siege. The past few years have seen unspeakable atrocities in Ukraine, Ethiopia, the Congo, and elsewhere around the world. And right here at home, in our own enlightened democracy, hate crimes are at an all-time high. The ADL reports that anti-Semitic incidents, including assaults, vandalism, threats, and murder, rose 36% in 2022 over 2021, and 2021 was 34% higher than 2020. Our experience here at the Justice Department is consistent with the trend. Just this month, we obtained a guilty plea from a Texas man for setting fire to Congregation Beth Israel Synagogue in Austin. In February, we charged a California man with hate crimes for targeting and shooting two Jewish men as they departed religious service outside Los Angeles area synagogues. The victims suffered injury, but thank goodness they survived. The victims of the 2018 attack on the Tree of Life and New Light Jewish congregations in Pittsburgh were not so fortunate. 11 people died, and the trial in that case starts this month. Attacks against black people, the most targeted group, and against other marginalized communities continues to increase. We have obtained convictions for the murder of Ahmaud Arbery by three white men simply because he was black. For the mass shootings of 23 Latinos at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, who were targeted simply because they were deemed as replacing white people in this country. For a knife attack on an Asian family because China was ostensibly responsible for COVID, and for many, many acts of violence because of the sexual orientation or gender identity of the victims. 
But we all know that criminal prosecution standing alone will not end hate crimes, and that's why we're addressing non-criminal acts of bias that rear their ugly head in our schools, workplaces, and neighborhoods as we did recently in a Utah school district where racial harassment of black and Asian students was rampant. And that's why we're seeking to prevent hate crimes through education and awareness, including a community outreach program, United Against Hate. Last fall, Attorney General Garland announced that all 94 U.S. Attorney's offices in the country will host this program. Remembrance of the Holocaust is critical in this effort. As a motivator, as a North Star in the fight against hate, and as a stark warning of the hell that lies beyond the boundaries of the rule of law. We honor those who perished in the Holocaust. We sanctify their memory by rededicating ourselves to the struggle against anti-Semitism, racism, and every form of bigotry and hate to fortify the hope that humanity never again confronts evil so extreme, hatred so vile, and murder so routinized that we need a freight car of paper clips to help people comprehend it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Assistant Attorney General uh, Clark, for being here today and for your insightful remarks. Unfortunately, Ambassador Rashad Hussein is unable to join us. We appreciate his support. We also want to acknowledge Ellen Germain, the Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues. Her office supports this program every year. She is in uh, Poland at this point, remembering the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Next, I would like to introduce Eli Rosenbaum, Counselor for War Crimes Accountability, who will moderate today's program. As the Attorney General stated, many know him for his history of bringing Nazi war criminals to justice. He is now leading a team investigating war crimes in Ukraine. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn the program over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to have been afforded the opportunity to participate in this 30th annual federal interagency Holocaust Remembrance Program, in which we have a large number of federal agencies joining us here and remotely, including, for the first time, the National Defense University's uh, Joint Advanced Warfighting School in Norfolk, Virginia. Welcome to you. Uh, although this is the first time that this event's been hosted at the Department of Justice, uh, I, I feel, Wendy and Brandt, uh, uh, like I should say, welcome home uh, to the program as this agency has, as Attorney General Garland mentioned in his very moving address, a decades-long history of leadership in efforts to achieve accountability in the aftermath of the Adolf Hitler regime's genocidal rampage against the Jews of Europe. Those accountability efforts started at Nuremberg, where a great many Justice Department lawyers and other uh, professionals were part of the U.S. prosecution team, which was headed, as the AG noted, by Robert Jackson, himself a distinguished former attorney general. Uh, and those efforts, those accountability efforts, have continued well into this century when, for example, just three years ago, we tried a former Nazi concentration camp guard in a Memphis, Tennessee courtroom. Our victory in that case uh, set a record for the oldest criminal conduct ever proved against an individual in a U.S. court of law because fully 75 years had elapsed between the commission of the crimes and the issuance of the court's decision. I'm deeply fortunate to have been associated with DOJ colleagues, first at the former Office of Special Investigations, and then at its su successor, uh, the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, uh, 
colleagues who over a 20 year period from 1990 to 2010 uh, won more court cases against Nazi perpetrators than did all of the other countries of the world combined. A, a record that in 2021 led the US Holocaust Memorial Museum to confer on the Department of Justice its highest award, the Elie Wiesel Medal. Nearly all of our prosecutions have featured the testimony of survivors of the Holocaust and other Nazi crimes who, to help us pursue justice, have bravely revisited on the witness stand their ghastly experiences of victimization. As I have often said, they, the survivors, are the true heroes of these cases. The power of witness testimony in these cases has actually been evident since Nuremberg, the landmark trial that revealed and proved the basic facts of the Nazis' annihilation of six million Jews to a worldwide public. For example, at Nuremberg, the testimony of Hermann Grebe, a non-Jewish witness to a 1942 mass shooting of hundreds of Jews in Dubno, Ukraine, was a centerpiece of the presentation by Britain's chief prosecutor, and the testimony was quoted at length in the tribunal's decision. Permit me, if you will, to read an excerpt from his testimony, which still shocks despite the passage of 77 years. It is difficult even to read these words, and I will do my best. He said, I watched a family of about eight persons, a man and a woman, both of about 50, with their children of about one, eight, and 10, and two grown-up daughters of about 20 or 24. An old woman with snow white hair was holding the one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing with delight. The couple, married couple, were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about 10 years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to the boy. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted something to his comrade. The latter counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. Among them was the family which I have mentioned. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. By the way, Mr. Graeber received death threats in Germany because he testified. He later fled to the United States, settled in San Francisco where he uh, died years ago. He was eventually honored by Israel's Holocaust Remembrance Authority. The survivors and some others who personally witnessed the crimes uniquely have the ability to convey the horrifying, cruel reality of the actions that accomplished the physical elimination of nearly a third of all the Jews who were alive on the planet Earth at that time. Today, we will have the extraordinary privilege of meeting two Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, Manny Mandel and Peter Gorok. They have joined us on this stage. Both of them have honored the memory of the victims of the Shoah by bravely recounting their wartime experiences to audiences at schools, houses of worship, museums, and elsewhere. And all of this they have done in service of the well-known post-Holocaust imperatives, 
never forget, and especially never again. After hearing from them today, uh, in a necessarily abbreviated program, uh, you may wish to view the longer accounts that they've given in their online video interviews at the website of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. So by way of introduction, Mr. Mandel grew up in Hungary and was seven years old when Nazi Germany occupied the country in 1944. He and his family were deported to the notorious Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in northern Germany, which he and his mother miraculously survived. During its existence, some 50,000 persons, most of them Jews, were murdered by the then German government in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp complex, the German government. Among the victims was someone whom the Attorney General mentioned, 15-year-old Anne Frank, author of the now famous diary, and her older sister, Margot. Manny's father survived, and the family moved to this country in 1949. They settled in Philadelphia. Manny, Manny graduated from that city's legendary Central High School, and then from Gratz College, Temple University, and the University of Pennsylvania. He married his wife, Adrienne, uh, in 1958. Manny was a practicing psychotherapist in nearby suburban Maryland until he retired in 2014. Mr. Gorog was born in Hungary in 1941. The Hungarian government sent his father, Arpad, to a forced labor battalion in Nazi-occupied Ukraine, where he died, likely having, having frozen to death. Peter and his mother spent the war living under increasingly harsh conditions in Hungary, which I will ask you about. Uh, increasingly harsh, especially after Nazi Germany invaded the country in March 1944. After the war, Peter grew up in communist Hungary and earned a Master of Science degree in electrical engineering. He defected to the United States in 1980, the year I started working at the Justice Department. Uh, he worked here on various NASA projects, such as the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes. So Peter is a longtime Fed, like many of us here. Uh, Peter, too, retired in 2014. Both of these gentlemen volunteer at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, where countless visitors have heard their important first-person accounts. So now... Let's meet Manny Mandel and Peter Gorog. I will ask some questions, uh, including great ones uh, submitted by some of the 66,000 children in the Defense Department's education activity schools around the world. Welcome, gentlemen. I go. I guess I go first because we can both go at the same time. One, two, three. So I'm going to ask uh, an open-ended question first of each of you. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't pretend to know how to ask the specific questions that, in a short-form uh, situation, would elicit really the the stories that you want to tell. So um, I, I would like you maybe to begin with your family life before the, the, the depredations began, and to tell us what happened to you and your family, in your own words. It's rather coincidental that Peter and I both are from Hungary at this particular get-together. I'm sure that's not planned that way, it just happened that way. But one of the things I want to make comment about is the fact that we are significantly enough different in ages that I have memories of Hungary that he didn't, wasn't yet born. He'll talk about it later. I want to make a comment about the fact that I happen to be a, a fan, I suppose, of a statement that you've heard a thousand times, whose author you may not be familiar with. But you all will recall, those of us who do, do not learn our history well may be doomed to repeat it. 
George Santayana said this over 100 years ago, and I'm delighted that all of you are here because it seems to me that by being here, you want to learn more history. You want to understand more history, and that's to your credit. Eli mentioned that I, the Hungarian government was occupied by the Nazis in 1944. But you need to know that prior to that time, or prior to 1942 or so, Hungary, because of its particular relationship to the Nazi government, had a very interesting and different history than many other countries. You'll recall that Hungary was an ally of the Nazis. Admiral Horthy, the lead, the regent of Hungary, was a ally and I guess a personal buddy of Adolf Hitler. But as a consequence of the interwar years being as they were, the Hungarian Jewish community, to the best of my knowledge, had an exemplary life. Freedom to do anything they pleased. The Hungarian numerous clauses, the various rules that were promulgated, were passed in the early 1920s, but not enforced until well into the 30s. As a consequence from what I know from my parents is before I was born, their life was quite good, as was the life of the Hungarian Jewish community. It did end at a certain point. My father is from Eastern Hungary. You know it as Transylvania, the home of Count Dracula. <laughs> My mother is from Southern Hungary, which is really Northern Yugoslavia, which was ethnically Hungarian and is to this day. We were living in Budapest and in the winter of 1941, my parents decided to take a short trip, about three hours by train, from Budapest to my mother's hometown. And again, as Europe was in those days, my father's village when he was born was Austro-Hungary. It became Czechoslovakia. It is now the Ukraine. The village didn't move. My mother's hometown didn't change, but it had several names, depending what language was the language of the day. The name of the community is Novi Sad and Hungarian Uyvidek. We took the train and spent time with my grandparents and stayed in the home of my mother's younger sister. Two or three days after we got there, I don't recall the day specifically, we had a knock on the door fairly early in the morning that said, two police officers came in and said, ladies and gentlemen, you need to dress warmly. It's winter time, there's some snow on the ground, but it's not bitter, it's just winter. You need to get dressed, we need to have you come outside to the sidewalk, we have to conduct a census. Now, the Nazi government believed that by conducting a census every 20 minutes, they knew where everybody was, and they were right. We do it every 10 years. Interestingly, as I recall, these two police officers were particularly decent, and they said what they had to say, and then they left. My father's recollection was that they were rather rude, different perception. We got dressed, put on boots and whatever, and went outside, stood on the side, where we were told to turn left, and to start walking in that direction. Now I recall clearly, I'm four and a half, I'm five and a half years old, we walked for a very long time, a couple, three hours. I walked, my father carried me, my mother carried me until we arrived at a place which peculiarly I recognized. It was a seven foot stockade fence on our left, the sidewalk, and a fairly major road, like maybe Constitution Avenue on, on our right. People were lined up walking towards what we noticed were the gates on this stockade fence were open. Now, why did I know the place? European cities that are not on the ocean or on lakes, but on rivers, make beaches out of their rivers. The Danube River ran three or 400 yards to our left. And in the summertime, maybe in August of that year, some months before, I was there for a vacation and was playing in the sand and doing whatever was done at a beach resort with games and with restaurants and with hot and cold running pools and thermal pools and everything else. Lovely place. I recognize this. Why we were there, of course, I didn't know, nor did anybody else. As we were marching forward, nobody was hassling us too badly. We're walking forward. It happens we are probably 150 yards from this open gate where people seem to be turning left towards the river. A police officer on our right says to my father, Mister, what are you doing here? My father was bewildered, but he said, I'm here visiting with my family, to which he said, that's not my department. If you are here and you're gonna be counted in this census, which he believed was going on, it's gonna mess up the numbers. We can't have that. Step aside. 
So the group that I was with, my grandparents by that time, aunt, and so forth, stepped aside, and within seconds in my recollection of that stepping aside, a official car came down the road, a uniformed person came out, had a power with some of his cronies, and announced through a bullhorn, ladies and gentlemen, the requirements of the census have been met. Go home. When I say nobody, I'm willing to believe nobody, not a soul in the place knew what had happened. We were reasonably certain by this time there was no census going on. Let me tell you what happened. We went back to my aunt's house. Phone calls kept coming in. The first was from my mother's other, other sister who said, where were you all day? We told her, she said, well, two police officers came to my door at 7.30 in the morning, asked me three questions about census issues. I gave them a cup of coffee and they went bye-bye. I was home all day waiting for you to call. What happened to those who went to the beach was this. People who in fact went through those open gates and marched down to the waterfront, which was ice. The Danube had three feet of ice that had been blown open that morning by cannon fire. They were marched and lined up along the river and they broke on ice places and were shot. Just shot. Never to be found again unless the bodies came up down river or in spring in March when the river thawed out. This was a senseless, purposeless, useless exercise in the local government under Nazi control doing that which they wanted to do and nobody could stop them. This, ladies and gentlemen, what I described to you was a pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M, a senseless exercise in power that people had over you. Now, my recollection of this is quite clear. The meaning of it is absolutely obscure, but it is not obscure now, but it was then. I was a five and a half year old kid, but I experienced it. The next morning, bright and early, my father called for a taxi to take us to the train station because we had the notion that being home is important. Now we had family in Novi Sad and nobody in Budapest, but Budapest was home. And I have to tell you as anecdotal, anecdotally that the ride to the train station was very exciting for a five and a half year old. They had regular taxis and they also had sleigh ride cat taxis with one horse with bells and stuff. And for a kid that was terrific. So we went to the train station with the thing, went back to Hungary, went back to Budapest, and life continued. As life continues, I'm gonna skip some time, I'm going to school, the yellow star comes in, and in, on the 17th of March, 1944, Adolf Eichmann arrives in Budapest. Now you need to know, if you know your history, that there was a conference in 1942 no, there was a letter in 1941 written by Hermann Goering on behalf of Hitler to talk about the final solution of the Jewish problem. In 1942, there was a conference in Berlin called the Wannsee Conference in a villa which still stands where they made the decisions of how to go about doing this final solution and the point that Adolf Eichmann as the henchman of the whole process. He cleared out all the countries. The last one that he cleared out was in fact, because of his allyship, if you will, to the Nazi government, was Hungary. So we came last. He arrives on the 17th of March, and I am advised that at that point, people are deported to the concentration camps or to the death camps like Auschwitz at the rate of 14,000 a day. That's a lot of people. That would mean that based on what the Attorney General said, in less than 10 days, all of DOJ would be gone. We were not affected by this directly, but certain things began to happen. As I said, the Yellow Star, my father was away from home more than he was home on labor camp duty that he was assigned to, but in territorial Hungary. Now let me just end up by telling you one more small story. As soon as Eichmann arrives, or within a day or two, two men from a self-appointed rescue committee decided to go approach him to, deal, to come up with some kind of a deal to save people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to approach Eichmann in those days was about as easy as if you were to go to Rome today and said, I want to see the Pope now. But they got there. 
and they began negotiating a deal. If Eichmann releases a million Jews from the various camps, they will supply him with 10,000 trucks laden with material for the war effort. Now there was a major problem with this proposition. He didn't have a million Jews to release even if he wanted to. It's late in the war. As far as 10,000 trucks, folks, these two men had, didn't have a hubcap, let alone 10,000 trucks. However, in negotiations to begin over here, and you eventually will wind up a bit lower. And they wound up with a deal whereby 1,700 people would be selected in a manner that nobody understands, except that my mother and I were part of it. Don't ask me how, I can't tell you, because I don't know. And we would be taken to a neutral port. Neutral ports in those days were Spain, Turkey, and it could have even been Germany, which was not neutral, but they controlled it. We got on a train, there were 35 cars, 1,700 people, fairly cramped, not very comfortable, and we rode around for nine days with some detours because of air raids. We wound up in a place that none of us had known of. When I say none of us, I don't mean me because I'm a kid, but the adults didn't. And that was, as Eli mentioned, the place called bergen Bells. A concentration camp, not a death camp, but a camp, a labor camp and a transit camp. What the Nazi government did is they made the arrangement whereby we would have 1,700 people on these cars for a trade-off of enormous amount of valuables, portable valuables, jewelry, that kind of stuff, gold, silver, not money because money was useless. These were put into suitcases and were held to be given to the Nazi folks, I could give you names, but I won't at this time, for the purpose of exchange, this is a barter. You need to understand that at this point in the war, everybody with the exception of Adolf Hitler knew that the war was lost. And the leadership from Heinrich Himmler down were looking for ways of making arrangements for themselves to protect their rear ends after the war and money would help. So these deals were made. I was not the, our group was not the only one, there's several others. And I knew some people here who were part of other groups. In any case, we were not expecting to go to Bergen-Belsen. Negotiations continued, and that after six weeks, about 350 people among the 1,700 were released to Switzerland. I wasn't one of them. I spent the whole six months in Bergen-Belsen with all of its hardships, with all of its difficulties, which I can detail if asked. And I was in Switzerland in a children's kind of a boarding school when the war ended. And I need to end by telling you the war, of course, ends on May 8, 1945, a very important date for three reasons. The war ends on May 8th. It is the birthday of the President of the United States on that day. Harry Truman's birthday was May the 8th. I forget what year, but May the 8th. And the third person whose babe birthday we celebrate that day is mine. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. That was uh, a lot to cover, and, and you did it uh, in a very abbreviated form. Thank you. Peter, if, uh, if you would um, um, gift us with uh, the story of, of your family and your experiences, please. Being a child survivor and only four years old when the Budapest ghetto was uh, liberated, my personal memories are uh, very few, especially uh, the last eight or ten months of uh, the war and the Holocaust. But from what I heard from my mom, what I um, saw in the pictures um, we have in the family albums, um, I know that uh, my parents had a relatively normal middle class Jewish life in Budapest. Most of their friends were Jewish. My father wanted to be a lawyer, unfortunately. Uh, he tried three times and he was rejected three times because the anti-Semitic uh, numerous clauses law. 
he became an office manager. They had a comfortable home. My mom was a female hat maker, which was very fashionable in the 20s and 30s. And they had a relatively good and quote unquote normal life until 1938, 1939, when um, the first, second, and the third anti-Jewish laws were um, enacted in Hungary, and then life became very hard for them. My father was taken to the first uh, labor battalion when my mom was three months pregnant with me. Uh, the way it worked that after three months of service, uh, he was released for a week or two. He had to go back again. Fortunately, on the very day when I was born, he was home. And the pictures which were taken that time is the only memory I have of my father. He was taken to Ukraine where he died. We don't know where, we don't know when. What we know from the survivors who came back later on and uh, wrote their memoirs or um, told their stories that some of them died because they were frozen to death. Some of them died because uh, of mercy killing by the Hungarian officers who saw uh, those weak and um, tired people who couldn't march anymore. They sat down and temperature was in the minus, minus 20s and 30s. And later on when they were tried, their defense was that it was a mercy killing because they didn't want those person um, uh, to suffer. Some of them died because they were used as human shield, um, used them for um, diffusing uh, mines uh, as uh, the Hungarian and German troops uh, tried to occupy the whole Soviet Union. And the way uh, they uh, diffused it, they had them march through the mine for, minefield and the uh, mines exploded and so did the people. Meantime, we lived in Budapest with, again, in relative comfort in our apartment until, as you said, uh, March 1934, the Germans occupied Hungary. They were afraid that although Hungary was an ally of Nazi Germany, they were afraid that Hungary, Hungary would uh, switch sides. And that's when hell broke out for the Hungarian Jews. Until then, on, only, quote unquote, 60,000 Jews died, um, mostly uh, in the forced labor battalions. In a matter of three months, uh, about 450,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to mostly Auschwitz and died. Here, your, your immediate family uh, working. Uh, your immediate family survived, but your grandparents barely survived, right? Unfortunately, on my father's side, um, uh, his two uh, brothers um, died also in the forced labor battalion. My paternal grandparents died uh, one uh, during uh, the war, one right after they were in their late 50s, early 60s. So out of my mom's nine siblings, um, five survived only because two came to the United States just before the Holocaust, and um, three of them survived in uh, Budapest. The, the grandparents who died of quote unquote natural causes had not had proper nutrition or medical care during the war, and they died right after the war, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, my mother and our grandparents died uh, within months uh, when they were liberated in the Budapest ghetto for quote-unquote natural causes. I would like to pose to each of you these marvelous questions from the students, but I don't have a marvelous question of my own, but I have a question. 
Um, I'd like to pick up on what Attorney General Garland said and Assistant Attorney General Clark said uh, about the responsibility uh, of government to protect its citizens, and, and especially I would say its most vulnerable um, citizens. Um, two governments, Germany and Hungary, uh, victimized your families and yourselves uh, in, in monstrous ways. Has that nightmarish experience impacted how you view uh, the positives and negatives of, of government inaction or inaction uh, here in your adopted homeland? Well, I am at the younger one, so <laughs> if the I answer first. Well, um, the Hungarian government um, did not did not protect their citizens, their Jewish citizens, and um, the Hungarian was actually complicit in the death of three out of every four Hungarian Jews by providing logistics, by having the Hungarian police rounding up the Hungarian Jews, escorting to the, them to the railway station, escorting them all the way to the border of Poland when they turned them over to the Nazis. After the war, we had democracy, democratically um, elected government until 1949. Um, what that government did was um, they tried to, actually they did try those who were responsible for war crimes and many of them were hanged and um, sentenced to long um, jail term. 1949, the Hungarian government was taken over by the Communist uh, Party with the help of the Russian troops who were still staying in Hungary. During that system, I as a Jew was safe. I was not um, persecuted because of my religion. At the same time, the very same government strongly discouraged religion, so I grew up without religious education. And um, is the question covers my time in the United States also? <laughs> A different way, um, uh, has it uh, impacted uh, whatever trust and faith you might have had in government um, here? Yes, when I came over here uh, in 1980, um, the reason I came here because the communist system was so rotten and I didn't see any sign that it would ever change. Uh, fortunately, it changed nine years later. Not necessarily better, but definitely changed. So I came for freedom. And the freedom I enjoyed, enjoyed from the very first day. I didn't have to think twice what I say publicly or privately, because in Hungary you were very careful what you said privately, because there were all kind of uh, government agents, uh, sometimes your very colleagues who would report you uh, to the police. So I did enjoy that freedom and um, recognized the difference between the two systems including freedom of uh, speech, freedom of uh, assembly, freedom of religion. Actually, that's when I um, returned to the, my Jewish faith, which I wasn't able to practice in Hungary because I was a government employee at a very prestigious uh, institution, um, research institution, and I could have uh, lost my job had I participated in religious activities. Mm -hmm. Any the same, same question? I would have to answer it differently because I left Hungary when I was eight years old. I have returned two or three times since, but much more recently. 
So the Hungarian specifics I'm not familiar with. I never lived under their rule at the, after that time. <clears throat> I think in some ways the Hungarian government was a small puppet to the large puppeteer called the Nazi government. I think that the Nazi government exemplified that which government can do and shouldn't. So what I've learned since is the important value of government, the tremendous need for government, but appropriate government. I'm not saying right or wrong, left or right, but the appropriate government. After all, there needs to be always some level of government that does that which the previous level is unable to do. The federal government can do that which the county government cannot do, etc. and so forth. And I think there's tremendous importance. I've learned the value of government and I appreciate it. I'm somewhat upset with what I see sometimes, but that's fairly normal. So I would say what I've learned from the experience was two, two pictures. One, what government shouldn't do and what government can do. Thank you. Uh, let's take the three questions uh, from the students. Uh, so again, Peter, we'll start with you. Uh, from Mr. Proskauer's class at Ramey Middle High School in Puerto Rico. Uh, they ask, to what extent do you think that modern society and or governments have learned from the past, such as the Holocaust, to prevent things like that from happening again? The Holocaust was a unique event in history in a sense that it happened at a special place, at a special time, to special people. It is unique in nature, however, the consequences are very universal. When there is hatred, when there is discrimination, regardless whether it's based on religion or skin color or uh, any other attributes, um, there is a possibility that it ends up in genocide. And unfortunately, my private opinion is that we did not learn from the Holocaust. Since then, there were um, genocides uh, in Uganda, in Cambodia, two million people died, uh, Burma or Myanmar, uh, and, um, and there is a war going on today in the very land where my father died. I never thought that uh, it would be possible that in the center of Europe there will be another war. So I am pessimistic in a sense that um, we have been doing the United States government, the uh, United Nations, tries everything, but it's just not enough. Thank you. Manny? I would agree with Peter for slightly different reasons, but if you ask the question, what have we learned? The answer is not quite, but almost nothing. You recall I started my talk with a comment about George Santayana. We have not read him. We do not do that which he said. As a consequence, we do not know our history. It's amazing to me, and this is just a little quip on my part. I'm a volunteer at the Holocaust Museum, and sometimes I spend time at the information desk. And that's where people come in and ask lots of questions. And I tend to ask them questions as well, like important questions like, where are you from? They can usually answer that, but not much beyond that. There's nothing really west of the Mississippi, uh, west of the Hudson River in New York. Our knowledge of history, our knowledge of geography, generally speaking, no insult to anybody here, is abysmal. Now, if you don't learn history, you don't know where you came from, and if you don't know where you came from, it's very difficult to decide where you're going to. Well said. Uh, ask the, the next question, many of you as well. This comes from Mr. Bartel's class, Ms. Bartel's class, sorry, uh, at Quantico Middle, Middle School, not too far from here in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, and, and I'm gonna expand this question in a couple of ways because you were both very, very young during the time of the Holocaust, so I'll expand it to cover also uh, the period since. Um, were you able to maintain your faith 
during uh, the, this time uh, of the war, which seemed like perhaps the end of life, um, or in the aftermath? Uh, and if so, how? Well, you're right by saying that we were both very young, certainly I was. And the question of faith, I don't think enters the mind of an eight-year-old. At least it didn't enter mine. I didn't feel my faith was being in any way threatened, and I went on from day to day. It's interesting to note that since the most difficult part of my Holocaust experience was in Bergen-Belsen, you need to know that people's need to form natural kind of lives under any circumstance is enormous. When we went to Bergen-Belsen, we were going to go on this trip to the neutral port to go by ship. We were told to pack some food. And people discovered, my mother included, and discovered that there are ways, there's a factory in Budapest where she knew the owners or whatever, and you could take tin cans of food, sanitize them, put food in them, and have it resealed, which hermetically seals it and protects it to a certain amount of time. We got to Bergen-Belsen, and many people had these tin cans, and they used them. And after they used the tin cans, there was no separation of garbage and recyclables, they used the tin cans, and guess what they did? At least some people. They made jewelry, bracelets, necklaces, rings, which they then traded for haircuts and cigarettes and shoe repair. In other words, the notion of business being started to approximate the natural part of life was instantaneous. A synagogue was created, as a matter of fact, as you might laugh if some of you know this, there had to be three synagogues, because one was not enough for 1,700 people. The details are not important. But what I'm saying is that in my experience, clearly, my sense of my life as a Jew was not threatened for two reasons. It wasn't, and two, I didn't understand when it was being threatened. Peter. Well, I cannot answer for myself, being so young uh, during the Holocaust and no concept of faith at all, but I do know that my parents kept their faith during the Holocaust. I do know from my mom's diary and my mom's postcards that almost in every page, in every card, they mention that the good Lord will reunite us one day, that with the help of the good Lord, would, uh, we would survive and um, we will have peace. I do know that they kept their faith because I was under those circumstances, circumcised on the eight days as our religion requires. I do know that uh, my mom kept their faith because I learned um, the Shema, the traditional Jewish prayers, uh, almost unconsciously, because every night my mother put me in uh, bed. She said that traditional prayers, and I knew that prayer at age two and a half, three. I didn't know what it meant. And I do know that my mother kept her faith because um, she kept lighting the Shabbat candle until candle was available or candle was used for um, a source of light while we were in the temporary bomb shelter. And I also know that after the war was over, my mom turned away from religion because um, she couldn't believe a benevolent God who allowed to happen what happened to the six million, what happened to her husband and, and relatives. And um, when I came to the United States and I had Rediscover, rediscovered my religion and um, I started practicing and my mom came and visited us and saw that uh, we light the Shabbat candle every Friday night. Um, she started to do it again at right page of 80, 82. So that's what I can tell you about my religious experience. Thank you. 
Uh, one more question from the students. And uh, this one comes from Mr. Russell's class at the W.T. Sampson Elementary High School uh, in uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, has there been a uh, modern day representation, uh, either in theater or in the movies, television, that would be, you would consider an accurate representation of your experiences? And if so, what would that be? Uh, Peter, I'll let you take it first. Well, there are many good representation. Uh, some are uh, controversial. Nevertheless, uh, I personally like it. And um, um, the Italian movie, um, now the title escapes my mind. Um, it's about a father who tries to make uh, the circumstances bearable uh, for his son, telling all kind of uh, stories, uh, making up uh, stories just to keep the spirit of this young child uh, alive. Other one, uh, Again, controversial, it's a television series, The Hunters. Uh, it's probably the interest of uh, our audiences. People are taking vengeance in the 60s and 70s of those um, perpetrators who weren't caught by the Justice Department or uh, the justice organization in Europe. And it's um, a kind of... Um, Absurd, nevertheless, um, it's an interesting insight how survivors uh, try to cope with the trauma they suffered. Interesting, that was the, the Al Pacino series. On, Correct. Uh, yeah, on Netflix. Um, oh, I think there are many. Many? I think there are many, many uh, things. There's a great deal of books and films, certainly Spielberg's Schindler's List is a good representation with, I think, many accuracies and, of course, a certain amount of dramatic license. Uh, I would only add, it's interesting, of how we view these things. One of the things I did in my life, and the details are not important, I did some substitute teaching in the Montgomery County school system. And, of course, what you do when you are a substitute, you do what the teacher leaves for you. And one of the times, uh, they left a film to be shown about the Holocaust, I couldn't change it, although I could have easily, but I was not permitted. And I asked the people, the administration, whatever, have they seen, in fact, Schindler's List? To which I was told it is banned from the school system, at least at that time. Why? It has nudity. <laughs> it has two seconds of a shower, so-called shower, in Auschwitz. That's nudity. And for that, that's very short-sightedness in terms of knowing what's going on. Let me close because we're right uh, Let me Sorry. just, uh, uh, I, meantime, I remember the movie title, It's a Beautiful Life. Ah, yes, It's a Beautiful Life. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to uh, ask the last question, which is for each of you. Um, what is your message for uh, people here and around the world who are watching uh, the two of you today? When I make presentations um, on behalf of the museum at colleges and uh, schools, um, there is a slide. A slide shows uh, the rounding up of the Jews of Budapest. And on the slide, on the left side, you can see a German soldier. In the middle of the slide, you can see Jews um, walking down the street in the yellow stars on their clothes. And in the background, you can see people. You can see bystanders physically standing by, looking at uh, the people who might have been their colleagues and neighbors, going to the railway station and going to a certain death. And among the people, uh, people in the pictures, uh, you can see some of them 
smiling. It's not just being a passive bystander. They were a kind of encouraging the kind of brutality which uh, was in front of them. So when I show that slide, I tell the students and um, the audience that one thing um, you cannot be, you cannot be a bystander. When you see hatred, when you see discrimination, regardless against who, you just cannot stay silent because the six million could not have been killed without having so many bystanders who did absolutely nothing to prevent the Holocaust. Thank you. Manny? I would agree with Peter completely in terms of being a bystander. I would also add only one other item, something I talked about earlier. Go and learn. Educate yourself, your family, and others, because I'm willing to make, and this may be brazen of me, but I'll do it. In this room, there's a lot of lack of knowledge. In addition to the fact there may be a great deal of knowledge, I'm not knocking that, but there's probably a great deal. All of us can use much more in the admonition that Santayana left with us. Go do it. Thank you. Uh, in a moment, we'll uh, view a recorded address somewhere up there, uh, uh, by the Honorable Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, but before we do that, I, I think I speak for all of us in the room and watching around the world when I say thank you to both of you so much for um, informing us and inspiring us uh, today. God bless you both. Maybe not. When I pointed up there, I thought, I could have sworn there was a screen there, and, and here it comes. This past January, in respect of Holocaust Remembrance Day, I visited the National Holocaust Memorial Museum and in its Hall of Remembrance, I was given the honor of reading the names of survivor Susan Warsinger's family members who had perished in the Holocaust. Ms. Warsinger, now 93 years of age, was there. She has been volunteering at the museum for more than 20 years. After reading the names, I thought of my own family members, great grandparents, great uncles and aunts, who also lost their lives at the hands of murderous Nazi hate. I thought once again about who my relatives were, what their full lives might have been, and how they could have continued to make the world better. The blessing of their memory endured in the lives and teachings of my mother and grandfather, what they taught me about the fragility of life, the meaning of remembrance, and the building of resilience. The two of them would have been very worried about our safety today, for today we live amidst a significant rise in anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, and we are experiencing a parallel rise in acts of targeted violence born of that hate. My mother's and grandfather's guidance would have been cautionary, but directive. Take stock, stay alert, and act. Remembrance, after all, may be a noun but it speaks of action. In the Department of Homeland Security, we are focused on partnerships. What together we can build and together we can do as a democracy that demands tolerance. We inform, educate, and train. We develop and share best practices through our Center for Prevention Programs and Partnership. And we build capacity through our targeted violence prevention grants, nonprofit security grants, and other critical and critically needed programs. 
we are proud to support the development of a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. We are proud to join all of you in partnership to combat the rise in anti-Semitism and work together as a community to build tolerance and the environment of peace and safety that it nurtures. Our work together across the interagency and with our non-governmental partners is one important way in which we honor those whose lives were lost, including Ms. Warsinger's family members, my own, and assuredly many of yours. It is one important way in which we all can define remembrance. Thank you. Thank you to Secretary Mayorkas for that message, and we're grateful that he mentioned Susan Worsinger. Um, some of you may remember that she spoke at our program last year. Before we begin this more somber and hopeful ending to the program, I want to thank all who made this event possible. To the planning committee and leaders, participating agencies and officials, sign language interpreters, and our Department of Justice host, this event would not be possible without you. Waiting for the screen to rise fully. Thank you. At this time, I would like to recognize all the survivors and descendants of survivors who are here at Department of Justice and tuning in from around the world. I invite you to please join me in rising in body or spirit. Thank you. The Nazis wanted to extinguish, extinguish your flames. Against all odds, you are here with us. As we looked around and think of those joining us from afar, each of you is a miracle. Survivors such as Michael Taylor, who is 100 years old and watching from New Jersey. Michael, you were a part of the resistance and helped to save many people. Others of you dedicated your lives to the American public or those around you. You helped us explore outer space. You provided mental health treatment. Because of your survival, your descendants have the duty to make an impact. My hope for us as the descendants is that we emulate those like the recently departed Judy Human. She was the daughter of two parents who escaped the Nazis and her parents refused to allow their child be mistreated because she had a disability. She was often called the mother of the disability rights movement, and she served in several federal positions throughout her illustrious career. Her impact continues throughout the government and around the world. To our survivors, may you, your descendants, and all those you have impacted continue to be a positive change. Thank you. Now at this time, I would like to ask our candle lighters to please move towards the, the um, candle lighting area. Cultures and religions around the world use a flame or a candle. In the Jewish tradition, we use candles during joyous times, such as during Hanukkah, as well as in times of sadness. The Yortzeit candle is lit in memory of those who are no longer here with us, including today on Yom HaShoah. These six candles represent the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. The last candle has been designated in a variety of ways. The millions of non-Jews who were murdered, the righteous among the nations who, at personal peril, saved Jewish lives, or as a symbol of hope that no group is subjected to acts of hatred ever again. Although we use electronic candles here today, this is only appropriate as we think of countries around the world, such as in Ukraine, where we, people lack the electricity and other public utilities they so desperately need. 
Today, we honor our survivor speakers, their families, descendants of survivors, and leaders in this year's Remembrance Committee. Dr. Manny Mandel, Holocaust survivor, retired psychotherapist, and Holocaust Museum volunteer. He is joined by his family. Peter Gorog, Holocaust survivor, retired engineer for NASA and other federal agencies, and Holocaust Museum volunteer. He is joined by his family. Karen Crump Wilson, civil rights attorney at the National Labor Relations Board with 33 years of federal service and speaker's committee chair. Tracy Klein, FBI management and program analyst with almost 15 years of federal service and printed program committee chair. Many of her family's members fled to the United States and Israel to escape the Nazis. Margarita Melendez Gote, Department of Education Committee Representative and Poster Committee Chair with approximately 30 years of federal service. This remembrance program began at the Department of Education 30 years ago, and Margarita has continued that legacy. Matthew Gever, Program Analyst in the Office of Justice Programs with 13 years of federal service. His grandparents, Jacob and Rocha Gever, and Father Eli were from Dogov Peels, Latvia. His grandparents did not survive but his father escaped a Nazi labor camp. He also represents 3GDC, a group of descendants, particularly grandchildren of Holocaust survivors from the DC area. And lastly, Isabel Flores Kaufman, vice chair of this remembrance event and Department of Justice Equal Employment Opportunity Program Manager. It is only appropriate that she light this our last candle, giving her 23 years of federal service and dedication to civil rights, her work in the Jewish community, and on behalf of federal employees. She is an example and a ray of hope for all of us. Thank you all for joining this important program. We appreciate it and have a good day.